Hello and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about health tests and screening. So we use health tests and screening to try and determine whether or not someone has a disease or is more likely to develop a disease and to uh, then target uh, resources towards them to help prevent the progression of that disease or to help them from to prevent them from de developing it at all. So this is a very standard uh, practice done in public health uh, and can actually be really helpful for uh, decreasing uh, uh, the impact of uh, particularly non-communicable diseases but also communicable diseases as well. So what type of health tests do we use uh, in uh, public health and medical uh, care? Well, uh, we sometimes use things like physical tests. Now that might be physical examinations of the body. For example, uh, the reflex test where they hit your knee or um, maybe checking out your breathing uh, with a stethoscope, stethoscope. So those are the things that sort of are physical traits that you can measure and assess. Another is imaging. So we do a wide range of different tests to see what's going on inside the body. Um, and uh, that can tell us whether someone f f perhaps has a uh, uh, developing cancer, for example, uh, through those images. Another type of test that sometimes is used is called a challenge test. Uh, an example of this would be the stress test, where you ask someone to exercise and see whether see how their body and heart responds to having that stress on their body. So you're you're responding to a challenge to your body in some in some form or another. Then there's a whole range of biochemical slash genetic tests. So this is looking at cholesterol levels or looking at a gene to see whether or not you have a specific mutation or not. And this can be very helpful to assessing risk. And then there's also a lot of tests that try and ask people questions. So uh, it could be, be informational questions. So it could be, do you have a family history of this disease? So did your parents have heart disease, for example? Okay. Or it could be information about whether or not you're exposed to different types of occupational risks. Um, uh, or it could be something that's more psychological. So you could ask people to ask answer questions about their psychological state. So are they having a lot of uh, disturbed uh, sleep or um, a lot of stress in their life? Are they feeling uh, feeling depressed in various different ways? And these are uh, these questionnaires can serve as a way of measuring things that suggest whether or not someone might be at greater risk for a disease. So when we're thinking about these tests, uh, I just want to clarify some terminology here. So first off, there's the idea of positive and negative results. So very po often people say, oh, I tested positive or I tested negative. So just to be clear, when someone says they test positive or negative, that does not mean what a good or bad outcome, all right? Uh, what testing positive means is that you, the test identified the target factor that you're trying to measure. Um, uh, so if you're testing for tuberculosis, it identified that someone has tuberculosis. And if you test negative, it suggests that the test did not identify a disease that you're, that you're testing for, okay? So that's, uh, that's a negative test. Now, again, remember testing positive for a cancer is, is actually an a, 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 a unfavorable outcome, right? Whereas testing negative uh, for not having tuberculosis, for example, would be, typically be seen, seen as a positive outcome or, or a favorable outcome, right? So the two are often reversed, but sometimes it will depend on the case. The main point here is that when you test positive, it means that whatever you're looking for, you found. Uh, and when you test, test negative, you, you didn't identify that condition or factor that you're, that you're assessing. All right. So we often talk about uh, tests like diagnostic and monitoring tests. So these are tests that are typically used in medical or clinical settings, uh, usually with a patient who already has symptoms. So they're already experiencing a disease. So diagnostic testing can help clarify if someone has symptoms, clarify uh, of a disease, they're experiencing a health problem. It's clarifying what that disease is that they have. So sometimes uh, clinicians go through a process of trying to do some puzzle solving to figure out what's going on with the patient. And these diagnostic tests can actually be quite helpful for that. Uh, then we have monitoring tests. 
So monitoring tests are uh, tests where we know that someone has a disease, and sometimes clinicians need to update that over time. For example, if you know someone has hypertension, you want to keep on tracking that over time to see how that's progressing, whether there's been changes, because that might change how you handle it clinically. So this is typically seen as tertiary prevention, um, because here we already the person already has a disease, already has a condition, and our goal in doing diagnostic and monitoring tests is to prevent further damage or further harm to them from that, from that disease. Now, when we think about public health and public health um, prevention, uh, we often uh, think about trying to prevent a disease before it really ha has progressed very far. And uh, to do this, we do what are called screening tests. So screening tests are to identify people who are asymptomatic, asymptomatic, meaning they're not experiencing anything that makes them think that they have a disease. They're not ill in any sort of way. Um, but we, we do these screens to assess whether or not they're likely to develop a disease later on. Okay. So uh, these screens can actually be quite helpful because they allow us to do secondary prevention to prevent a disease from progressing from its initiation to actually prevent becoming a disease that's causing uh, physical symptoms and harm, right? So that early prevention can have a much greater overall health impact if we can do that. All right. So when we think about uh, doing this in a public health way, uh, I've already talked about some different strategies. So if you think about the population, here we're looking at th three different possibilities, the individual level, the population level, and the screening level for uh, dealing with uh, populations. So imagine that you have a population, and uh, in this case, people who are green are people who aren't very likely to develop a disease, uh, green or red perhaps, uh, people who are uh, in, um, in pink might be at, at greater risk for disease, uh, and people who are in orange also might be at greater risk. And then you have uh, the one person who's in yellow, who's someone who's actually going to develop a disease, right? Let's just assume that that's how, what these colors mean, roughly. Well, um, in a, a clinical setting, we typically focus in on an individual, Right. So here we're looking at an individual. We're saying, does this person have symptoms? Are we concerned about them for specific reasons? All right. And that's sort of the, the that focused approach where we take people one at a time. All right. Then we also have the population approach, and that's where we might uh, treat an entire population or take a public health intervention where we just assume that everybody has a risk for disease and we take make efforts to decrease their overall risk. And that's the improving the average approach, typically. And you can sometimes do screens at a population level. So every time you go into the clinic, you do get your blood pressure checked, for example. And that's a population-based uh, screen because we know that that actually is effective if we do that with everybody. Um, and then there's the idea of risk stratification. Uh, and this is... Uh, uh, using a screen, some sort of way of identifying a group of people who are at greater risk. So you identify that smaller group of people who are at greater risk uh, using the screen. And then uh, since you know that it's more likely that one of them is going to develop a disease, we can actually then target more of our resources towards those uh, individuals. And this is called the high risk approach when we think about overall population health approaches. So um, again, the idea here is that if you have an overall population, it's helpful sometimes to stratify that population in terms of how much risk they have for disease, and then target your resources, target your money and efforts towards the people who are more likely to develop that disease. And that's where screening comes in. It can be really helpful for doing this. All right, so what are some of the key assumptions uh, about screening? Um, and we're gonna focus in on screening for the remainder of this talk because that's mostly um, what we think about in terms of public health prevention. That being said, all the th most of the things I'm gonna be talking about in terms of assessing the quality of a test are things that are entirely relevant for diagnostic testing and monitoring as well. So uh, specificity, sensitivity, things like that. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, but those are also really important for clinicians to understand generally for any type of test. All right, so when we're thinking about um, screening, the major idea behind this is that Hopefully, if you detect something earlier, that will actually be able to do something about it and lead to a more favorable prognosis or a favorable health outcome. 
So remember with diseases, there's sort of a natural history. There's a progression that occurs as a disease, evol uh, as a health condition evolves. So you can have an initiation. So uh, that's where you first start having, you know, that first uh, set of mutations in the, in the cell. Um, then time is going to go by and, uh, you know, the cells might divide in cancer, for example. And then there's going to be a point at which a time at which the disease can then be uh, detectable by a screen. For example, you wouldn't be able to tell that this cancer is, is evolving um, until it reaches a certain size, for example, and you can, uh, it can actually see it through uh, imaging technology or, or through some other way of detecting it. But there will be a point in time where you can start to detect it. Um, then it reaches a point where people are actually having clinical symptoms, all right? Now, really, the time at which screening is useful is before, as soon as, uh, between when it's detectable and before clinical symptoms occur. Because once clinical symptoms occur, people usually go into the clinic to actually get it looked at, right? Um, so screening is really trying to identify people before they have those symptoms, right? Now, once you have clinical symptoms, then you can do diagnostic testing. And as a disease progresses, you might be doing mon monitoring testing. And ultimately, you know, if, if your efforts don't succeed, then natural history of, of certain diseases will lead to death. Some will just be a chronic disease that you'll have throughout your life. Okay. So that's a, the idea of natural history of disease. And that if we can get it before people have symptoms, that that earlier uh, detection will lead to better health outcomes. All right. So the truth is, is that screening sometimes is useful and sometimes it's not useful at all. All right. Um, there's a few set of criteria that we need to think about to determine whether or not a public health screening strategy is actually warranted. So the first off is that the disease that you are considering actually should be a disease that really has some substantial impact on health. All right. So more minor diseases diseases that you can treat just as effectively after symptoms are, have occurred. In some cases, in those cases, very often it doesn't make sense to do uh, public health screening. Okay. Um, the other uh, criteria is that early detection is possible. There's some diseases where it's actually really hard to determine that someone has a disease before uh, people start having symptoms. Um, so, the quality of the test, the, how early it can detect something it really makes a difference here. Then there also needs to be a feasible strategy for, t for screening. Okay. So screening can be hard. It can be, have a, a wide range of different factors related to it. You have to have clinicians who are ready and prepared to do that screening. You have to have an infrastructure in place that can do it properly. Right. So there has to be some sort of way to do this effectively and feasibly in order for it to be useful for health. Um, so there are certain screens that might be interesting and, um, you know, potentially helpful, but they, because of various different constraints, they're actually not useful in, in, in the real world. OK. And then there's another factor saying that screening is acceptable in terms of the harms, the costs and patient acceptance. Um, so. Some screening, uh, so first off, when you think about harms, just having to go through a test, go through a screen, can ha have an impact on people. You're asking people to do things. That's why we don't do screening for diseases where it isn't really going to make much of a difference in terms of, you know, if the disease doesn't have a substantial impact on, on morbidity or mortality, right? So um, some, some screens are challenging. I mean, if you're doing a spinal tap, for example, for a screening thing, well, that's a pretty serious harm. Uh, that you're doing. It's a fairly painful procedure. Okay. Another thing is costs. So uh, some screens are actually pretty expensive. So that's a consideration in, in healthcare. Is this, are the benefits, is there cost effectiveness in terms of going forward with the screen, right? Uh, so there's, there's challenges there. And then there's patient acceptances. Uh, there's some uh, types of screening, which patients really don't like, even if they're really quite effective at detecting disease. Uh, things like colonoscopies are things that people are often very reluctant to do, even though they're actually quite effective. So uh, understanding how likely people are to accept or be willing to do that screen is something that's important as well. So these are the things that we think through when we decide whether or not a screening is warranted in a public health context. All right. 
So what is the logic behind screening? Well, remember, we're looking at people who we may or may not be able to detect the disease yet. So we're trying to figure out, um, is this screen actually a good thing to use? How effective is it in actually detecting a disease? Well, uh, this table here is essentially showing um, the reality. So along the top is the disease. So this is essentially whether or not people have the disease, they are positive for that disease or negative for the disease. Again, positive meaning they have the disease, negative meaning they don't have the disease. So that's that along the top, that's, that's the truth of the matter. That's whether someone actually does have that or not. All right, along the other side is the test. And whether that screening test is telling you that someone has the disease or does not have the disease, all right? So sometimes the tests aren't perfect. Sometimes they, uh, you know, in an ideal world, they would always tell us a true positive. So if someone has the disease, uh, the test will tell you yes. And we'd hope that if people don't have the disease, they'll, you'll get a true negative, which is saying that the, that the person doesn't ha uh, the test is telling you that the person doesn't have the disease, right? But tests aren't perfect, all right? So sometimes you'll have false negatives and false positives, all right? So that uh, a false negative is when someone actually has the disease, um, but the test uh, says that they don't have it, all right? And uh, a false a false positive when, is when the test says that people do have the disease, uh, but um, it actually turns out that they um, uh, they actually don't have the uh, have the disease. Okay, so that's when the test is actually wrong. So why do we look at these things? Well, this allows us to assess how good a test is, right? So there's a few different measures that we use for this. These are sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and negative predictive value. So sensitivity is uh, the probability that if someone has a disease, that the test actually tells you that they have it. Okay, so that's going to be some percentage of the time where the test correctly identifies that someone has a disease. All right. The specificity is how frequently the test, the percentage of the time that the test accurately says that someone doesn't have a disease if they don't have a disease. All right. So those are terms that are very commonly used and you would need to understand if you ever pursue a clinical career. Okay. Now there's also a term positive predictive value and negative predictive value. Okay. These are also really helpful because when you're a clinician and someone comes into you and you, you, you read them back the results and um, you say, well, it turns out that you're actually tested positive for this disease. Um, so you might actually have uh, um, you might actually have uh, a cancer, okay? So the person then is going to say to you, well, well, doc, how, how likely is it that I actually have that disease? I know that tests aren't always perfect. You know, what's that probability? Well, that's called the positive predictive value. Essentially, that's the percentage of time that people who test positive actually have that disease. Okay, that's what that is saying, Okay. Whereas the negative predictive value is uh, if you tell somebody, well, actually you tested negative, you don't, it looks like you don't have this disease. Someone might ask, well, how, how, how sure are you that I don't have this disease? And that's a negative predictive value. That's what says the probability that if you get a negative result that you actually don't have that disease. Okay. So these are the measures that, that we look at in terms of tests. Now, which is more important, sensitivity or specificity? Um, now, tests will have different components here depending how we cut put uh, together thresholds. Um, partially, it's going to depend on the impact of the disease. All right. So, if you have a really serious disease where people will die if you don't detect, detect that, disease, that disease, for example, serious cancers. Okay, you know, uh, cancers that progress really fast. Well, you really want to catch that, right? So um, you might have lots of false positives, but you want to set it so that if there is a positive, you can get it and you can see it, right? Specificity, um, sometimes you might, um, maybe a disease progresses slowly or it's not a very serious disease. Um, then in, in those cases, you might favor specificity. So you might want to say, we don't want to have a lot of false positives. We want to... Um, we want to sort of really focus on, on the people who are true positives 
and uh, have a very specific test, right? So we don't have a lot of people who think that they're potentially going to get the disease, but who actually aren't, all right? So that might be situations where you focus on specificity as a, as a measure, okay? So here's just some examples for those calculations, how you might go through for a disease and, and measure this uh, numerically, all right? So as I mentioned earlier, you often set a set cutoffs for actually determining how to um, uh, the sensitivity and specificity of a test. So for example, if you're looking at a molecule in the blood, for example, you might have bell curves for people who are healthy and people who have a disease. And then you'll have a cutoff between them to set, separate out you know, what concentrations of that metabolite indicate that someone has a disease or, or don't. Now, what I'm showing you here is an ideal scenario, all right? This is a scenario where the people who are healthy have very different results than people who have a disease. But the truth is, is that for most tests, this actually isn't the case. For most tests, it's not that really that distinct. So in reality, it actually typically looks more like this. So um, here, uh, we're looking at blood gl glucose level concentrations, and this is a test for diabetes, all right? So if you look at a population, people who are diabetic might actually have a range of different results that they get for this blood gl glucose test. Uh, whereas people who, who are healthy also will have a range of results as well, all right? And that might be due to error due to um, the test itself, uh, error within the test, or it might be because, you know, just at the time of day that you happen to do the test, people happen to have a low or high bl blood sugar level. They just say the snicker of a spar or something like that, right? So, um, you know, these things vary within both a healthy population and the diabetic population. So you'll notice in that purple area, there's an overlap. There's situations where people who are diabetic might have a lower uh, blood glucose co concentration than people who are healthy, right? So that means that you have a situation where it's actually kind of confusing whether or not you determine whether that someone is uh, has a disease or doesn't have a disease, right? Um, so the point that I was making earlier about uh, choosing a cutoff is how concerned you are about whether or not you miss some people who might have a disease or whether you want to uh, minimize these false positives. So imagine that you set the cutoff at uh, X on, that, on this chart. Well, if you set it at X, that would mean that you would get, the, you, and any, anyone above X was determined to have the disease. Well, that would mean that you capture everybody who has di diabetes. But what that means also is that all the people who are in that sort of red purple area who are healthy are also going to be told that they have diabetes even though they don't, right? Whereas if you pick the threshold at Z, right, uh, and say that everybody above Z has diabetes and has the disease, where well, you're going to get a whole bunch of people who have the who have diabetes, but you're actually going to miss a fair number too, right? So in the blue and uh, purple area, you have people who are diabetic but aren't being testing as positive, right? So this is one of the challenges to designing screening tests is to pick the right threshold. So in this case, you might pick Y. Uh, that might be a better threshold because, you know, that minimizes the false positives and false negatives. But again, it's going to depend on the disease that you're dealing with. For certain diseases that are very serious, right, uh, a fast-moving cancer, for example, you're going to want to pick X, right, uh, because you want to get everybody who has that lung cancer as fast as possible, right? Um, and you might have false positives, but um, but you'll, you'll deal with that as it comes, right? Um, so, so again, how you choose that cutoff is going to depend on the disease itself, right? It's not necessarily the case that you want to maximize sensitivity or specificity. You're going to make a choice between those two because often there, it's a trade-off between the two. Uh, there's another thing that is sort of an interesting trait of screening tests that you should be aware of, which is that the prevalence of a disease actually makes a really di big difference for how these screening tests work, all right? So um, if you're talking about this, um, here we're using sexually transmitted disease, uh, disease chlamydia, uh, in this case. Um, again, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, uh, screen tests are very often used in uh, non-communicable diseases, but you can also use them for, uh, for communicable diseases as well, infectious diseases, you know, 
we many of us do HIV tests regularly, uh, uh, STD tests, or uh, other types of tests for infectious diseases that um, are are important as well. So here here the example is chlamydia. So imagine that you're doing this test at a uh, STD clinic, so a free clinic where people can come in and uh, get tested for STDs. So uh, here um, you find that the positive predictive value and the um, negative predictive value are actually really good. So 93 and 99%, okay? That's actually looking like this test is actually working really well, right? Um, however, there's something about STD clinics, which is that um, you'd expect that the population prevalence of an STD might be really high in that, in that, at that clinic because people often come into an STD clinic because they think they have an STD, right? So imagine that the prevalence in that clinic is 30%. Now imagine another scenario, which is private practice, you know, your normal doctor that you go to, and maybe you just get, go and get a checkup a STD test. Well, there the prevalence might be 3%, okay? So because you're not coming into the clinic specifically for STDs or concerns about STDs, you're coming in uh, just for a regular checkup, all right? So again, prevalence would be lower. All right, well, you take the exact same test with the exact same characteristics in terms of testing positive and negative, um, but you're because the prevalence is lower, you're going to get much more false positives, all right, than uh, proportionally uh, than uh, um, than you would expect otherwise, right? Because you're you're there's so many people coming in given the test pro uh, uh, the. Um, the test characteristics, you're just going to find many more more people. So you get the positive predictive predictive value here. If you test positive, is actually only about fifty percent in that context. So you take the exact same test and use it in two different contexts with different prevalences, and it means something entirely different. Okay. So it's something that you should know about these these tests. Okay, so how do we actually do these tests in practice? Well, there's a few different things, approaches that we sometimes use, all right? Um, so, um, so one is the idea of sequential testing. So uh, this is when you actually have two different types of screening tests that are available. And essentially what you do is you do the cheaper one, the cheaper one first, perhaps, um, perhaps it's one that's perhaps not quite as good, it's cheaper, um, but you do that first, and then you follow up with a more expensive test that's more, more typically more accurate, All right? So in those sequential testing scenarios, someone is seen as being positive only if they test positive for both of those two tests. Then there's also parallel testing. Parallel testing is when you do two t screening tests that s sort of measure slightly different factors. So. Um, for example, for colorectal cancer, they do, uh, sometimes do a parallel test where they use two different techniques, one for the upper and one for the lower colon. All right. So two different technologies, two different strategies uh, that are used to detect. They both detect colon cancer, but they t uh, do it in parallel to detect it in different locations. OK, so those are two different strategies for um, screening uh, that can be quite helpful. All right, so um, that's screening in a nutshell to, uh, and health tests in a nutshell. So again, health tests are incredibly useful for helping us identify diseases for uh, uh, secondary and, and tertiary prevention strategies. Um, there's a wide range of different ways that we use these tests, everything from psychological surveys uh, through to biochemical tests. And uh, by using them, we can actually get um, a pretty good idea of how we can prevent a disease before it progresses uh, in a population and segment a population into people who are at higher risk so that we can target resources to them. Um, there's a range of different factors and challenges for, uh, for screening. Again, the idea that um, figuring out the thresholds, thing, figuring out the quality of that test, and the, recognizing the fact that these tests are not perfect. Very few tests are perfect in terms of measuring whether someone has a disease or not, regardless of whether it's uh, a screening test, diagnostic test, or a monitoring test. So it's important to think about and uh, address in your in your thinking when, when we do these take on these strategies. And of course, we also need to think about when it's actually appropriate to do a screening test in a public health context as, context as well. So 
lots of things to think about. It's a very helpful and important thing when it comes to, um, to health and public health, both medicine and public health. Um, we spend a huge amount of our, our healthcare resources on, on testing of various sorts. So there's a lot of money that goes into it. So one of the major things that we do in terms of healthcare, uh, because uh, when it comes to non-communicable diseases, it's one of the main things that we can do and most effective things that we can do to, to, to prevent, monitor, and treat uh, a condition. All right. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening and take care.